Truth and Transformation, why, what, how? Truth and Transformation, why, what, how? These questions I would like to address. What is it all about? Why are we doing this? And I would like to invite you to a small journey. We'll go through some chapters and we'll start with an initial analysis. That's what you normally do. Why is something needed? What is it all about? Problem analysis. Statistics of membership of the large churches are an outward indicator for a re a destructuring of Christian columns in Western European nations. So we're concerned about Europe firstly today. You can also transfer to other places in the world like North America and other areas in Asia, but we will focus on Europe today because Vishal will speak on Europe afterwards too. Statistics are obvious. I mean, 1950 in this beautiful city of Stuttgart, there were more than 80-85% of citizens members of one of the two large churches, almost 90%. Today it's less than 50%. So today we have memberships 20 to 20 percent, little more than 40 to altogether, you can recognize that something has happened. Of course, it's not automatic if someone is a member of this church, everything is well. But by this number of memberships, you can certainly recognize a trend. Be before someone leaves the church, there's a story behind it. It has a history. It doesn't happen from today until tomorrow. And then I would like to show you to a few books, there's a whole s lot of books, I just picked out three. One is Ralph Bergmann, Free Society and uh, Its Enemies, a German book, German physics professor. He tries to anal analyze in what kind of a situation our, situa our society is. He shows with great, care, great worry and concern we are in close con contact and in the last 12 months his concern has greatly increased that the free society in view of a scientist, he is a professor of physics at the University of Bremen, leads an institute there and he observes that we are stepping back away from freedom in our society. A very a process a process that we should be very concerned about. Many people don't realize it. It's happening hmm, on the sidelines, but it will have grave effects if we don't stop it or don't even observe it. Giuseppe Garcia, his book is on our small book table that can be looked into, not bought. In his small book, Utopia Method, he talks about a cultural battle in our society. He is redactor of the major German newspapers, The World and others, and he observes societal process and observes that something is happening. We are confronted with we are guided into dead-end roads by a model of utopia and politicians tell us like there were no other exits, no other ways. And Christianity and all this burden of history is taking away our freedom. So it's the exact opposite of what we believe the truth is. And this is a societal, an increasing societal consens, consensus. Johannes Hartl wrote a book, Eden Culture. He is a Catholic theologian, philosopher, leads the largest prayer house in Germany. And he asks the question, what's happening in our society? He talks about several issues. I listed a few of them. Firstly, in all of his book, he addresses various factors. Education is perceived as something programmatically anti-Christian by an increasing number of observers, that it is being realized that educational processes are intentionally filled with non-Christian, anti-Christian narratives. It's happening alongside. It's st being steered through positions that have influence on the writing of school books, of curricula, of uh, curricula. It's a dangerous process. Our children are being alienated from Christian. Energy. The other is a, medi a media side uh, movement 
It's a one-sided report, a strong tendency to exclude truths. I'm not talking about the, uh, the TV stations, big TV stations that are known for superficial report, but even standard media that we recognize as that we have uh, observed and uh, considered as reliable media in the past, but they are considering the Christian foundation of our society as a problem and not as a heritage that has brought us where we are. So the opposite of what we learn from history is being communicated in media and politics. We also see a hollowing out uh, of Christian offers, the offers of churches. I have taught confirmation classes myself. We did a lot of nonsense and we enjoyed it. And our, our pastor had a lot of difficulty, but it still shaped my character because I saw this man who tried with dedication to serve us, make the Bible dear to us, and bring songs and uh, composers. The song that Roland quoted, I learned, I memorized in my confirmation class. They are present in my, you know, these character-shaping value systems in church and in school and in the houses and families, they are missing. They are no longer there. We have an increasing corruption, even in the West. I teach business ethics in a German college in Heidenheim, and I have to deal with the question, what does our economy look like? We have growing corruption, even in Germany, not only in Italy with mafia, here in Germany. It's not only happen, not happening on the daily level as in some other countries where when you need a passport you give a hundred dollars and uh, then it goes a little faster, but in economy, in the commission of new jobs, it's uh, a lot of money flowing and it's happening for years already. We have a trend. Destabilization uh, of values. I don't have to mention the big scandals, Wirecard, German banks, Comex, Kuncom scandal. We've had a number of big scandals in Germany as to um, corruption. In his analysis, Johannes Hartl describes a loss of connectedness. It's a term that he uses purpose-giving identity, creating personality, answering the question, who am I, where do I come from, where am I going to? Purpose is no longer a topic that is, that is uh, present, and beauty is a term that is lost. If you look at modern art, of course you can have different tastes, but the question, where do you see beauty? Can you recognize beauty in it? It's a big topic. You really have to look for it. So we have a certain starting position that is being added by personal experience, like on a playground, destructive children on playgrounds. Earlier you would have said it's vandalism. Today, parents sit next and they grin. I think, oh, it's nice. Children destroy play grounds and they paint uh, with paint public uh, property with colors that cannot be removed. And if you look strange, and then the parents say, well, it's okay, the child needs space to develop herself, himself. So there's no sense that public property is, belongs to everyone. There's no perception anymore for problems. So and recently in our family, we had the question, a baptism takes place, and you're in a society and you realize no one is really aware and uh, knows what's happening here. So you carefully ask the question, like the, the godfathers, have you thought about what this means, what you're doing? Yeah, yeah, everything's okay, everything's fine. And if you ask a little deeper, you realize there's nothing. No idea about faith. If you ask what Pentecost is, they don't even know what Pentecost is all about. This Christian feast of Pentecost has no meaning for many people. Another phenomenon 
that I would also like to bring in as a an problem analysis. We have lots of contacts with Africa. And there, I'm realizing Kabuya is among us. He can confirm this. In Uganda and Kenya, we have countries with high percentages of Christians. At the same time, in these countries, we have high corruption and poverty. And there, of course, you ask yourself the question, if there are 80% Christian or 85 even in Uganda, then on the one hand, you have a super high rate of Christians that if you ask them, are you Christian, born again Christian even, they would say yes. And then on the other hand, you have these countries with extreme high corruption and this corruption is not happening in the 15% non-Christians, but with the rest as well. So you ask yourself, something is wrong, something has gone wrong, how can this be possible? Then if I retreat to the West or turn the focus to the West, I, I perceive that increasingly self-centered Christian churches, show-oriented, fleeing the world and program oriented, waiting passively for the rapture or just concerned with the enjoyment of the moment. Do what you like, enjoy it, just do it. <laughs> Not being involved in societal context. Most churches have no sense that they have responsibility for their society and that there's a problem in society. This mixture that I've just tried to paint what is the starting position for us, the stage on which uh, truth and transformation has become a topic for us. I would like to discuss, look at three biblical topics that I feel we need to rediscover. I think they have been, um, there's been a, under a pile of rubble. <laughs> We've lost them. First is the question, what is the role, the commission, and the identity of the Christian church in society? I can only touch this in the beginning. I have a large course about it. I could give you a two-week seminar on it. But if I look into the Sermon of the Mount and see how Jesus speaks to his disciples and tells them, you are the salt of the light, uh, salt of the world and the light of the world. What does that mean for the Christian church today? And where is it being perceived? Where is the sentence being reflected, thought about, meditated and filled with content? I don't see so many places. Rather do I see it's being treated on a superficial level. Yeah, we are salt in the world, we are church, and through us good things are happening in our city, very generally speaking. But I think this is not what is meant here. Salt of the earth and light of the world are strong terms. If you look at the opposite, without salt, no contrast, no survival, chance of survival, no taste, it's boring, it will die, doomed to death, no future. Light, the opposite, darkness, utter darkness. That means if the, unless the churches see themselves as light of the world, where is the light? What is our task? What does it mean for us? And here I can only touch it. We would need to discuss this in more depth, but we can do it around the tables. I'd like to add a second aspect that we often overread or overpray. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. What do we say with it? What are we praying here? We don't even know what we are praying. The interesting thing is that Jesus taught us this prayer. He challenges us to pray this and to work in that respect and to invest ourselves in making, bringing his kingdom, making it bring about, come about. How is the kingdom of God? What does it look like in heaven? There, the things that God loves are being done. That what is important to God is being appreciated. That what God is saying is being done 
and put into practice in the lives of the angels or whoever else is there, it's becoming reality. It's not being questioned. This perspective that we are saying we would wish and we long for your kingdom to come in this earth as it is in heaven. Jesus challenges us. He calls us into developing a prayer structure that longs for God's kingdom to become reality in this world as it is in heaven. That's what we need to meditate upon, think about. It has deep implications for our prayer life, our church life, for our identity as a church. What does it mean for us? Third aspect. Paul writes to Timothy in chapter 315, first Timothy, first letter to Timothy. If I'll be late, you should know how to behave in the house of God. Then he explains what the house of God is. It's a church and the church of the living God is a pillar and a foundation of truth. Even this picture is so unknown to us. The pillar and the foundation of truth, that's not for us, not for God. Of course, it's for the people around the church, a pillar and a foundation for the truth, for society, for this world, for the people that look at the church that are looking for orientation, that don't know where truth is, that are wandering around and are confused. If you just take these three aspects to digest them, think about them, it becomes apparent. There are so many more things that could be mentioned. But what is the role and the identity and the task of the Christian church here in society? And we can see it's much more than we normally perceive. It's much bigger. This concept is much larger. Second thing I'd like to look at, biblical foundations. Second point, the great commission that Jesus gives to the disciples. I'm a scientist of the mission. I've memorized this back and forth in Greece. Matthew 28, 18 or to 20 or 16 to 20. If you look at this passage, then uh, it says, we should go and make disciples of all nations. Etne, you can translate with peoples or nations, both is possible. I prefer the term nations because it's a, it, uh, an ongoing concept throughout the Bible that Jesus himself has used in the Gospels in different places. And the question is, what have we made of it? According to my opinion, what has come out of it is we have made it into individual conversion of individual persons. We've been reduced to individualism. We are uh, saying we need to help individuals to find a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, which basically is good, it's not wrong. But that's not what the text is saying. The commission is make disciples of nations. Make all nations disciples. I never thought about it, honestly speaking. And when we add the fact that this concept, nations, making nations into disciples, it's not the first time mentioned, it, but it's been mentioned before. That should make us think. And as much as if I make a nation into disciples, I have to think differently from uh, leading an individual to Christ, it's a different concept. It uh, causes a different, a different approach. If the commission is to install a system in a city, a new telephone system, and I have to think about how this telephone system could be installed in the whole city, I need to make a plan, how many people live there, what installations do they have right now, how does technology get into their house, what materials do I need, what staff, and so on. So I need to make a plan how to supply this city with a new telephone system or whatever. And if Jesus says that we should make nations or peoples into disciples, it's a different commission that also includes different activities than just leading individuals to a personal conversion to Christ. So there are several building sites that we have to think about. That's 
what I consider one of the core topics that we have addressed in Truth and Transformation. We need to address this partly forgotten commission of Christ and bring it into reflection. Then making disciples, another topic. A disciple is someone different from a converted person, a convert. Normally in the evangelical circles in Germany and US, we have this uh, image of Billy Graham, who has uh, spoken a uh, prayer of uh, commitment to Christ, then it's completed. He is a Christian. That's not what is uh, mentioned here. It doesn't mean that we hear, the text doesn't say we should lead individuals to conversion. Many individuals, nations and peoples, we should make them, turn them into disciples. What is a disciple? He is a follower, a learner. It's a different concept behind it and Jesus explains what that means. He says, by teaching them to keep what I have commanded you. Making disciples is something totally different from individual conversion. It's a life-shaping, life-changing, total, con total life-encompassing concept. It's more than conversion. Even this is something that uh, I feel we need to rethink. If I make a whole nation into disciples that live in a personal relationship of faith with Christ and grow in it, that requires a different plan. And Christ then, Jesus then says, teach them whatever I have commanded you. Teaching is a core activity in Jesus' commission. Yeah, Christians also do education. And they want to help all children to read and write. Education here is something much more. It's shaping of character. It's more than head knowledge. More than education means I'm learning from Jesus how to live life. And I'm teaching this by accompanying someone else who shows me how to live with Jesus. This concept of discipleship, we are walking together, we are helping each other in this walk with Jesus, life with Jesus. These are basic foundational questions to the existing concepts of church and Christendom that we have in our area. If I add the third aspect, I don't know who knows the book of Landa Kolb, A.T. Formel. It's uh, original in English, Landa Kolb. She demonstrates how the people of Israel, when we take the moment of Exodus, they were a nation, most probably illiterate, unable to read and write when they started. 350 years later, they were one of the highest cultures in the ancient, in the, uh, in ancient times. How did this ha come about? How could this happen? What has happened in the meantime? Firstly, first thing, God is very humorous. God gives Moses and to an illiterate nation uh, a table of uh, written Ten Commandments. First, you need to learn to read and write. That's my first task in order to understand me. We never thought about this in our educated culture, and I never, it ne never came across my mind. It's a fact that God challenges people to think, to learn, to read. That's why we have books here, because reading is part of the being um, uh, counterpart of God that we discuss things. We have reason. We can be of different opinion. That marks us as humans, characterizes us, and we are about to lose. This process of transformation from an illiterate nation to a high culture of the, uh, the Near East, the Middle East, this process we need to reflect, because this is something where God has revealed himself. God kept telling Abraham, I'm not choosing you because you're better. He said it to Abraham and then to Moses, not because you're better, I chose you. You're not at all better than the rest. Don't uh, get conceited about my choice. What I would like to do is I would like to demonstrate with you a model that can become a model for everything. How to become a, flo a flourishing, blossoming nation. 
I would like to show you how you can turn a nation of slaves into a flourishing nation with a legal system, with an education system, where people are treated with dignity and all the things that Roland already addressed in his speech. This process of transformation is another one, like the one we've seen in the Roman Empire. This process is exemplary. It is not to show us that, oh, Israel is great, they have the law and they know how to do it, and we poor ones, we don't have it. No, it's an example that he wants to give as a model for the rest of the nations how to become a flourishing nation. Do you see? The circle is closing here. God thinks in nations. God does not think in, individu in individuals. He likes individuals. He has created them. He but God thinks in nations and peoples. That's a foundational thought that we have forgotten about. God thinks, and it starts with the power of Tower of Babylon, where people are divided into language groups and nations. Paul confirms this in Acts 17. God has uh, attributed nations and borders to these nations for a certain time and then no longer. But that's God's concept. He wants to bless nations. And if you read the yellow book, and if you haven't read this yellow book, Soul of the West, there are at least two important chapters to this uh, aspect. So that's the third aspect, third foundation. Fourth, I would like to add this topic of 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. I can make it very brief. What you have heard from me in the presence of many faithful witnesses, commit other to other faithful people who are able to teach to others. Multiplication, several levels, training of leaders. I believe if we want to bless nations, this is a principle that we need to train future leaders and bless them with shaping of character. That's what the Bible is teaching us and giving us. What the Bible gives us is character development. So, starting from these four concepts, these biblical core concepts, if we rediscover them, then we can see how I think truth and transformation needs this. And this combination, it's something that I haven't found elsewhere. If I had found it elsewhere, then I would have joined them, but I haven't found it. That's why we started Truth and Transformation. This broadness, of course, I haven't found anywhere else. Of course, we want to cooperate with, uh, with everyone else who is on the same, uh, who are on their way in the same direction. Many partners, but we believe there is a calling to raise our voice for these topics in a time where many of these topics from these four have been lost and they are not so present in the church or have fallen under, gotten under the pile in the agenda, and it's at the bottom of the pile. That's, uh, yeah, that's a reason why we want to address this issue. The last point is a worldview issue. Worldview is a central topic that we need to think about more. In many Christian churches, it's not existing. The topic doesn't exist. It's not, as a, not known as a problem or anything. They don't think about worldview. There are narratives that are being told to us narratives about why the world is the way they are, that it is who we are as humans and who we are not as humans. These are part of what we call worldview. What's happening here is that the latest since the 60s through the Frankfurt School, a guided process, a determined process has happened that has indoctrinated people with a change of the goal of life, of uh, view of man, identity of children and of families, many elements are being changed. That's why we need a more tr better trained eye what to, to know what is worldview. 
Why do we have to think about it? And only with these five points that I have tried to, to describe, you may get an idea why we believe it's important that we give trainings and conferences like this, that we give a contribution to this large discourse that is happening. It's very important and that we cannot say we're the only ones who have understood, I think. We just line in and say, this is our small contribution. Now, briefly, need to watch the time. Finish in seven minutes. We're an organization. I've already said most of what I wanted to say. like to bring you into the large vision. What is the ideal that we are heading for, we would like to see? Firstly, churches are becoming places of education again, of character formation. They recognize their calling beyond shaping uh, services, worship, and providing for Christians and doing missions. I think the concept that God wants to use to bring this blessing into nations are churches. God uses churches. These are the small educational sites, the temples where he's being worshipped, where education is happening, where uh, appreciation is happening, families are being shaped. And then societies are being blessed through the churches that practice their commission in art, in music, in politics, in law, in economics. Societies are being blessed by churches that rediscover their commission. The third thing we wish is that future leaders will go through training programs that we develop offers where in leaders of integrity will be trained. A country is led by people, politicians, teachers, school directors, business people, different people, and they are being shaped somewhere. Their character is being shaped and educated. That's why we want to find and build places where this shaping of character can happen. Because our impression is there's a great hunger as many are searching for orientation because there's nothing left to provide orientation. Everything has become equal. And in this big stew where everything is equal, people are becoming desperate or at least open. I'm teaching in uh, colleges and I experience there's a searching and a longing for how is it going to go on. We want education that builds on a biblical worldview is available for everyone, from the kindergarten to habilitation, all levels. We want to uh, provide education and opportunities to reflect and discuss about education and reconcile. This is part of the educational process that we strive and discuss and find a compromise, even though it's difficult. That's what we need. We need to strive about it. And then a highly professional reflection process on these elements of a societal change. These things that I've briefly touched here, we need many more people than myself, the three of us here, need to sit together, define these things, the questions that I've asked today are only the intro into a discourse. They need to be deepened, widened. We need to learn. That's why I brought all these books for you to look at what is behind it. What we do here is a big, a huge project. It will be finished day after tomorrow. We don't have all the answers ready, neither have I read all these books, but there are many important things in these books that we need to learn and reflect and get to know. And even many non-Christians have written about this. We can learn a lot from non-Christians. There are good non-Christians around. It's not this 
narrowing of the mind that only Christian writers are agreeable. We need to learn to get into a discourse with the society about its existence, its future, its roots. And we do this, need to do this on a qualified level. These these sentences are normally not mentioned in the Christian halls like these. And we are not doing this. We don't have this and we don't want it. It's uncomfortable. It's tedious, hard work, but it's so important. If we want to have a future for our churches and our countries, we need these processes. Otherwise, we will perish. We will fall back into the Middle Ages and into uh, antiquity ancient times. They worry more about stones they're carrying around their necks, or uh, chains they have in their cars, uh, so they don't have an accident. We are on the best way to turn back to the old times. We don't have to go to Africa. This animism, this fear of a tree or a river or a cow, it's something I don't want us to have, but I see we are running full steam into it in the West. Last thing, the desired end product is a new ecosystem shaped by the Bible to transform society. An ecosystem in as much as it's not just a few conferences. No, there is an online platform where you can get this platform, kind of an alternative to Wikipedia that collects the science on the mobile phones, for your app, or wherever. There's a group of subject matter experts for every topic, Christian physicists, Christian sociologists, educational experts who communicate in a network worldwide and work cooperate to establish this ecosystem of education, curricula, lectures, and to reflect it and develop it and improve. That's where we need to go. What's the big vision behind it? This truth so that at the end of, day, of the day, nations will be blessed and brought to flourish. I will do a cut here. I have some more things to say. But I think this gives us a picture of what we are all about.